Korea, Korea Garwal comes to us from that team that did that Nephila genome back in 2017 and changed your world. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the American Museum of Natural History with the, Shai with the Hayashi Research Group, and she's going to tell us about the evolutionary history of Kerbalet Orb Weaver Capture Thread Spadrillans. Uh, Sandra, if you'd kindly share your screen. Okay, you can hear me? Good. Okay. Um, okay. So, well, thanks for the introduction, Krishan. So, um, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit of about um, one of the projects that I've done at the AMNH, and um, and it's in respects to the um, to cribbled silk. So, uh, just, just I'm just kind of running to um, hi. There you go. Oh, okay. So we all know that spiders are global citizens, right? There is uh, more than 49,000 species described. So that is not really surprising to us that there is this gigantic diversity, um, not just in their morphology, but in the way uh, they reproduce, the way they capture the prey, the way they displace from one way to the other, as well as um, how they eat, what they eat, and where they live. So one thing that does unify all spiders is the fact that they make silk, and we heard um, wonderful things about the silk in, in the previous talk. But um, when we say silk, we definitely refer to many silk types, right? So um, for example, when we look at, a, at an old weaver, we can see that it's made of at least five different silk types. Um, we have the, the, the frame and the radii, which is made of major ampullate silk. Uh, we have the attachment, which is made of uh, piriform silk. And we also have a, um, the capture spiral, right, which is the main topic of this talk, that is usually a composite. And here, because this is an Orwet Weaver um, web, I'm showing you a, the, the capture spiral that is a composite of the flagelliform silk, and it has the aggregate glue, glands, uh, glue droplets on top. So spiders have, um, they have evolved at least two different types of, um, I'm gonna say at least, because I just follow an Everhart, but, uh, two, two types of sticky capture threads. So one capture thread is, uh, has this wet adhesive and that's the one spawned by equivalent Arrhenius spiders. And of course the one that we are more um, kind of familiar with are all the spiders within the family Arrhenius, right? Uh, but there is also, we also know of the second capture thread which is the dry adhesive, uh, which I'm showing you down here and um, the cribbler, uh, this made by cribbled spiders, um, by cribbled spiders, and um, just like the name said, it's they call cribbled because they have the cribellum for where from from where the the cribbled silk is um, spun from. There are multiple families within Araneomorph, at least twenty one families that are capable of spinning or that still spin. Uh, these cribbler threads. The top, the one of these families, um, it's the Eulaborinae, which is the, the topic of this of this talk. Um, so Eulaborids are special in a way because not only they uh, they produce they produce cribbler captured threads, but they also make uh, orb webs. So what is cribbler silk? So just as a brief introduction, it's, um, it's again, it's a composite of multiple silk fibers, at least that we know. So we have um, the inner section is made of this, this pair of core, of core fibers, which uh, we think is, or we think, or we know that it's, uh, they're made in the pseudoflagellar silk glands. There is also the cribbler nanofibers um, and this, fibers are produced in the cribbler silk glands, which are located on the cribellum. There is also um, this third type of silk, the paracribular silk. And this silk, um, it's, it's thought to connect the nanofibers to the core or the main fiber. So you might, uh, the kind of the process of um, spinning cribbler silk, it's quite complex and I'm not going to get into much of the detail, uh, but just kind of in short, um, the, this, these nanofibers are produced by the, by, uh, on the cribellum and they're kind of spawned on the fibers, right? And then this fiber comes, comes these, all these fibers um, with the 
palamistrum, which is this modified saibi on, on the front legs. And then he makes this uh, kind of woolly snarkle puffs, right, which are very, uh, like a, a big characteristic of privilar silk. We also do know how, um, how this captured thread achieves its, its, um, its adhesion. We know it's a combination of hydroscopic forces as well as wonder wall forces and the absorption of um, particular waxes from prey. What we are lacking information from is this, it's on the genetics. So despite numerous um, crippled species, we barely are grasping the surface of what their, um, their silk genetics are like. So at least for privileged specific silk genes, we only have information from a handful of species and those include species um, in, uh, include Stengella, Baduma, there's a, some information on the Nopets and the recently published genome of um, the six species of Octanova. So, uh, what else are proteins? So, silk proteins, or oh, spidrolins, one of the silk proteins um, that, I mean, I've dedicated like 20 years of my life, um, they're all the spidrolins. So, spidrolins are known by being in a large family of proteins that are encoded by a single gene family. They're very long and repetitive. And I'm just showing you here a cartoon representation of a spidrolin protein. And, um, and its composition, kind of its architecture. So we see that it has the two terminal domains, the, um, the amino and the carboxyl, and then the inner section of the spidroin, it's um, the bulk of the spidroin, it's, it's highly repetitive. And repetitive in the sense that if you were to break it down, it's composed of this um, larger ensemble repeats. And then this ensemble repeats are in turn made of very specific amino acid motifs. Now, different silk glands are uh, are known to express different sets of spidroins. And each spidroin we know that is, um, that has a very specific repetitive composition. But then we also know that the expression of this spidroins can vary within silk glands. So it kind of gives you, an, it gives us an idea of um, the type of spidroin it will be as well as where it will be uh, mainly expressed. So we set out to catalog the spidroins for the privilege or where we were Eulobor diverses. And we use different, um, different genomic approaches. Uh, again, I'm not gonna get into all the details of the extensive, extensive sequencing we did because I, I want to get to the juicy part. But we did assemble two different transcriptome, an isoseq that was made from a total, total um, cell plant tissue. And for this, uh, we dissected out the collection of the silk glands um, and just try to avoid any other as much as possible. We also did uh, RNA stick transcriptomes from both cephalothorax as well as the total silk gland tissues. And we assembled a 10x genome, and that was also from total silk gland tissue. We use uh, different blood searches and annotation pipelines to annotate each assembly, which I hope you'll see in a, in a month or so. Okay. So what did we find? So one of the things that we first find was that Ulover diverses has all spidroins corresponding to the known spidroin types. And by that, I mean that we find spidroins corresponding to the major ampullate plate, uh, to the uh, tribuliform spidroin, spiriform, tubuliform, et cetera. But something else that we did find is that the set of spidroin genes in U diverses is consistent with the with the set that was recently described for these six octonova um, species. We also found that the amino acid composition, the approximate length and the organization of UDIF as by drawings are very consistent with the octonova. But not just to the octonova, um, they were also quite consistent with other non elaborate spiders. So we also found confirmation of our UDIF by drawing uh, functionality by expression analysis. And we used the transcriptomes that were derived from the total silk glands and the cephalothorax tissues. So we found that all identified spidroins here on the, um, on the 
the excesses that were um, that were expressed in silk glands, and most of them were actually expressed at high, at high levels. So not only did we find them in the genome, but we also have um, confirmation that there is that they are expressed. So in terms of um, in terms of uh, the fibrillary specific genes, uh, what we found, uh, we were able to assemble a mostly, mostly complete um, universe versus CRISPR. So this is, CRISPR stands for privilege is by drawing. And what we found is that it has a very uh, interesting repetitive region. So it's made up of three distinct repeat types here kind of indicated by different colors. And each, um, each repeat module has um, a very distinct amino acid composition. And not just that, but it's also repeated multiple times. So for example, module one um, is repeated at least five different, type, five different times within the sequence that we were able to assemble. Now, this, um, these repeat modules are not by any means unique to G. labora diverses. Actually, um, they're also present in other privileged spiders. So as an example, module one, it's, it's, um, it's the one that is conserved the most, at least with the available data that we have. And it has a 30, um, it has a, around a 40% amino acid identity across species. And that by a species, I mean, we compared them with Octonova, Tangela perfuga, Stegodiphus, uh, and Baduma. Module two and three, are also quite conserved and it has um, and they have um, an average of 78 percent identity across um, just the Ulibor. So that only includes a comparison between UDIF and Octonova. So we were able to recover a uh, what we are calling a full a full gene for PFLAG, and PFLAG stands for pseudoflageliform. Um, and so this gene is around, it, it's around eight kilobase pairs and encodes for a protein that it's about 2,600 amino acids long. Um, unlike what we know from the flageliforms by drawing gene from other e equivalent or word weavers, uh, we have no evidence that P PFLAG from, um, from your laborates have any introns. Something else that we found is that um, PFLAC has a very distinct organi organization. So it's composed, I'm showing you here, the repetitive region, and each line represents a repeat. So it's composed of 48 distinct repeats, right? But these repeats, they're actually clustered into four, di four distinct types. Cluster analysis show um, kind of depicted here by different colors show the different types, right? And they're also color on the side. They also have, um, they also have very distinct features to them. So each repeat has this 11 to 13 amino acid, what we call a spacer motif. And that just means that it's a, it's, it's a conserve, um, it's a conserve sequence that is glycine poor and it's usually in between glycine rich motifs. So About that- left, Sandra. 10 minutes, is it? You have about a minute left. Okay. Oh, wow. That went fast. Okay. And they also kind of uh, are organized into larger repeats. So just by looking at the privilege captured thread spy drawings, um, gene tree analysis, what kind of show is that the spy drawings that are associated with the, with the fibers, uh, they kind of cluster it together. We also, uh, we also found that the, um, the flag and the P flag spy drawings are a result of a dupli duplication event that likely happened around 250 million years ago in the most common ancestors of all this, uh, all the species here. Something else that we found is that um, AXPA or the aggregate spy drawings appears to be a result of a duplication event in the RNA equivalent, and it has an independent origin of the privileged spy drawing. Um, and uh, just about done. So we also wanted to kind of use the speak of morphology data within a phylogenetic network to investigate how the capture filaments by joints um, were associated. And what we found is that um, 
And what we are proposing is that there are two spy drawings that were not, that did not cluster with the non with the known spy drawing types. And we are proposing that this these two spy drawings are likely to be expressed in the paraprivalent silt glands. So here are depicted in uh, kind of this green. They cluster together with high support, and they're also only found in the species for which paraprivalent um, paraprivalent spigots have been described for. And so just to conclude, um, I'm just gonna kind of run through, through this. Uh, just to conclude, our data is kind of, it's kind of uh, really expanding our understanding on how the repeat architecture for all these different spy drawings can uh, contribute to privileged privileg um, privileg threat mechanical properties. And we also have put forward for the first time um, spy drawings that can that are likely to be the main components of the paraprivileged silk.